Hello guys and welcome back to another episode of our Growing Corn for Self-Sufficiency video series and today it's all about the harvesting and it's now early November and results are mixed because we've been hit really hard like we did with our sweet potatoes with mice um, and rodents this year basically um, decimating our crops and I think it's important to show you the highlights as well as the things that don't go quite to plan. Um, take a look around now and you can see that probably around about 60 to 80 percent of our cobs have been broken into and chomped away um, by I think a mixture of birds and rodents. Um, we've noticed a lot of uh, new mice and rat holes appearing around these beds, um, getting closer to the harvest time. We harvested our blue Hopi corn a couple of weeks prior to this actually, and I'll show you some footage of that now with me and Laurie harvesting. Uh, we ended up doing an emergency harvest of those uh, because the decimation was getting so extreme we weren't going to end up having anything left whatsoever. Because we had to do a bit of an emergency harvest on our blue Hopi corn, I would have liked to have seen the husks had gone quite a dry straw colour before harvest, but a lot of them were still very fresh and green. And the actual individual kernels of corn weren't quite mature enough. So in storage over the last couple of weeks, uh, a lot of it is going to be no good. Um, some of it's shriveled up and gone more like a dent or a sweet corn when that's dried for seed, whereas it should have stayed full and plump, nice and solid and shiny. So we do still have some, but fortunately, I saved a lot of seed last year when we didn't have these rodent problems um, that did get time to mature on the plants and seed saved from your homegrown cobs, if done correctly, should be uh, perfectly viable for two years uh, the germination will go down a bit in the third year, by the fourth year it's no good. So at least we have a backup anyway, that emergency store of our seed for next year. We also enjoyed some beautiful homemade soups that Laurie had made, um, that she makes up in bulk and puts in a flask in the morning that we can enjoy during the day here, um, which has been really nice. And I was a bit concerned we may not end up with any seed for next year of our sweet corn, because of course when you harvest sweet corn, it's still green and in an immature stage. It hasn't um, matured yet, like we're going to be harvesting the popcorn later um, when the husks have dried out a lot more. Fortunately, the mice did leave a couple of uh, plants, so we should have a couple of hundred seed at least for next season. I'm going to work my way through this bed of glass gem popcorn now and fingers crossed we've still got a decent harvest left in here. So an interesting observation I'm seeing here is that towards this end of the bed was the glass gem corn I planted direct from seed into the ground and as we go this way this was the uh, plants I grew in little modules and planted them out and although there was only maybe a week to two weeks difference um, I am noticing as you may expect um, the ones I planted uh, from modules that already had a bit of a head start have matured uh, slightly earlier on average than the direct. There was a time when they both seemed to have catch up with each other um, but as you can see here, it doesn't look a world of difference, um, but this one here is still quite green. And so there's risk with this because this is more of a kind of solid flint type corn. You don't use this one as a sweet corn, um, that it may not be quite mature enough now. Um, so I'm probably gonna have to leave the husks on for a few weeks and hopefully they will continue mature in storage. Um, this is more what we were looking for, so let's open it up and have a little look. This is our first time growing this and 
they are supposed to be multicolored, all different colors of the rainbow. Oh wow, look at that. Kya. How beautiful is that then? And our pollination looks to have been very good here. As you can see, we don't have many or any spaces at all actually in this one where pollination hasn't occurred. And it's quite a good example here how you can see um, one of the amazing things with corn is that each of these silks or hairs these are what catch the pollen uh, before the cob has developed and each one of these hairs corresponds to an individual kernel of corn here and you can almost see here where they're still kind of attached like little umbilical cords and so let's have a look now then to see whether there's any difference um, in the formation of this cob here which is still green because Many of you guys, if you're watching this, living in a more northerly area of the UK, you're probably gonna have an even shorter season than us, because we are right down in the south of England in one of the warmer areas. So this is actually, oh, lost my uh, husk off that one. Still looking good, um, for the most part anyway. As you can see, we have quite a different uh, kind of genetics going on in this one with more of the kind of purpley blues and baby blues in there. But some of the kernels right at the end here haven't quite formed up and they're still a bit soft here. Um, but these further back are still completely solid and you can poke your thumb in them and they barely even indent. And the reason I'm wanting to harvest these now, instead of leaving them on the plants for another few weeks, is that this is our fourth morning of frost now we've had here. And with the wet weather, completely damp and cold in the evenings, um, we do risk these starting to go mouldy inside and rotting. So in our climate here, we do have that issue. Um, and potentially, we could be dealing with frost damage as well. So here is one of our cobs that has suffered from some damage from the mice or the uh, birds, whoever may be coming in to have a bit of a feast. But on these cobs, this all is not lost because there are still good kernels back there that can still be used. So I'll still be collecting these up and we salvage what we can from them as well. I'm finding with the glass gem corn, there's roughly one to three cobs on each plant. As you can see, this one here that's been completely uh, had by our local animals. Um, the cobs are a lot smaller than the other varieties actually, um, which I did expect. But even on these, all is not lost because you can see there, there's still a decent amount of kernels which we can use for popping corn. So nothing will go to waste. These two cobs are off the plant you've just seen next to me here. And I've paid particular attention to this one because this plant has dried and matured much earlier than the others. And both the cobs are larger than the average size of the other plants, which makes this one a really good candidate uh, for genetics we're looking for moving forward to collect a seed. So I'm going to keep these two separately and make sure these are in our seeds for next year. I've just finished harvesting the bed of glass gem corn and you can see the pile of it here in front of me. I've got our two cobs that I selected that would be good ones for seed and what I'm going to do now is have a look through the pile and find some more that have matured uh, much earlier than the rest with a decent size um, cob as well. Some are very small. Um, there's a lot of variation. So I'm gonna be selecting for earliness and uh, 
cob size and from then on we're going to do one more selection process so let's have a look through here what we can find so that's a nice big one that's dried um, you see the sizes can vary quite dramatically there so we'll put that one in with our seed pile and what we're looking to do here is basically just make sure we're selecting the best and the strongest and the biggest for next year so we've got the best genetics moving forward. So that's a mature one there, but it's a bit of a slightly wonky shape and it's quite small. So it's not quite gonna fit the bill, unfortunately. Whereas that there is a decent size. So that can go in there. Okay, so I've narrowed our selection down to six cobs with all quite a nice length and size for this type of corn. So now let's open them up and have a look what kind of coloration we've got to the individual kernels because some of them are predominantly blue and purple, whereas others are a really nice rainbow mix. So I'd like to keep that nice kind of rainbow colour moving forward in the future. So that one's predominantly blues, a few whites and yellows in there, and greens. Let's have a look at this one. Okay, so this one's a lot more rainbowy, which is more what I'm looking for moving forward, to give it that classic look. I think these would make really beautiful gifts as well for people for, you know, Christmas is coming up. Um, so decorative, just, just beautiful hanging, but not only that, um, to be able to just pull them down when you fancy a bit of popcorn and uh, yeah, get it on the go. We all love a bit of popcorn. Oh, this looks like a nice one. Look at that, stunning. And another one of the amazing qualities corn possesses, as I mentioned earlier, these silks here um, correspond to the different kernels. And that means you can actually really selectively choose the genetics you want moving forward because say I wanted to um, go for a rainbow mix like this again I would make sure I select seed of all the multitude of different colours here which is going to give me the best chance for that uh, genetic diversity next year whereas if I collected just all of the pinks or all of the greens over time if I do that in succession um, I'm going to start ending up with cobs that possess mainly those colours. So um, yeah, it's really interesting and cool to know you could then go on to breed your own varieties. Um, and what makes corn quite distinctive in that way, you can speed up the process so fast, is that you can actually see the results that year. Um, what I mean by that is that if this was a pumpkin seed, you don't know really until next year when you grow on your seed you've collected because all the seeds look the same whether they've been cross-pollinated by another variety um, whereas with these you can see and um, I'll show you an example of that in a bit from our blue Hopi crop we had where some of the sweet corn genetics uh, some of the pollen had obviously uh, blown up there and so you've got some blue Hopi uh, flint corn with some uh, sweet corn in the mix as well. So that is our popcorn seed sorted for next year. Now all I'm going to do now is tie these up. You can just grab one of these cordline line leaves here. Really good twine. And cordage, always handy to have in the garden. Uh, New Zealand flax is even better actually. Tie those up. I 
Now we can just hang those and they will dry out nicely, ready for next season. Well guys, I'd like to thank you very much for watching. We've had trials and tribulations along the way, as always, there always seems to be something that pops up. The blue Hopi, as you saw, blue, grew and blew beautifully well. Um, but at the last hurdle, those mice or rodents just got in there and had their fill. So we're going to have to look into ways to help to reduce um, that problem next year. Because I think the more we grow, the more their population will grow. So we'll have to find um, some form of humane or possibly non-humane way of um, getting them, unfortunately. Um, because when you're starting to rely on crops for survival instead of just hobby thing, then yeah, just can't allow them to just have everything. So um, when I say inhumane, I don't mean any form of chemicals, but you know, we may have to look into some kind of traps, that kind of thing. Um, popcorn, so the glass gem popcorn, the results again were good, but that one is a slightly longer uh, season corn. I think that's 110 days. And we were right on the margins of that being um, harvestable in time before uh, the really cold weather came that would cause them to rot and deteriorate. So I think to do those, possibly getting them in direct slightly earlier or growing from modules for a corn that's around about 110 days. Blue Hopi, 100 to 105. That one, we found the last couple of years, that's been fine. Sweet corn, um, the super sweet variety, again, absolutely fine, um, direct. So you might be able to see behind me the last week I've been busy creating these new no dig beds. And these are gonna be actually for our potatoes and corn next year. The corn is gonna be growing right along the back here coming around in a semicircle this way with all potatoes in front. So that's what I've been doing the last week, um, getting the worst of the big bramble out of here and putting down a lot of fresh compost. So thank you very much for watching guys. Um, next season, I hope to show a bit more of how we're processing and using these things like the popcorn and the processes for drying them and for the flower corn as well, how we're doing that. So yeah, please stay tuned. Anyway, lots of love and peace and plants.